For sure. That sounds good. Uh, if anybody has a, like wants to holler at me in the meantime, that's totally cool too. So is everybody settled and good? <laughs> exactly and it's nice to use some homer imagery because my undergrads hate it when i do this um but they're not here so <laughs> Cool. Well, everybody there, uh, I wish I was there with you all. It would have been a great little trip, but the travails of work schedules and child care reared their ugly heads. So I'm back in London. Um, but yeah, I hope you're all having a great time. And is it like my notes? That's a weird. So, because that's not ideal. That's not the end of the world. So, does this change anything when I go like that? Let me try to restart the sharing and I'll see if I can get a better share up. Do, do, do. I could do, I guess, entire screen. All right, so there's the whole thing will show up. And then if I go like this, is it just a slide? Yay for technology. Cool. So the presentation side of mine is actually relatively brief. Um, and I mostly wanted to use it to kind of spur conversation. Um, because, yeah, implicit measures are as always, kind of an interesting and fraught topic in psychology. Um, and so I wanted to both walk through kind of what is the promise of implicit measures, and then my sort of wet blanket take on what they've delivered, and then what realistically we might be able to, like, what, where, how should we calibrate our expectations in terms of what we can do with them? Um, so if we're talking about implicit measures of religiosity, here might be a scenario that we're interested in kind of figuring out. So here's Homer, and verbally he's indicating that he believes in God, or that he's a Christian, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and we have great access to Homer's self-reports. Uh, they're relatively easy to measure. Um, that, that doesn't mean that there aren't complicated measurement issues with self-reports. There's loads of them. Um, but just in terms of the task before us, we ask people some questions. They give us an answer, maybe on a Likert scale, or I believe as the economists have recently rediscovered a feelings integer. Um, as, but anyway, that's what they tell us. That's the self-report. But we might be more interested in underlying cognition. So one possibility, a lot of my, my research is on atheism. Um, and one thing that we've studied a bit is, okay, if somebody tells us they believe in God, they might tell us that because they do sincerely believe in God, or they might be an atheist and they're just trying to pass. Um, so yeah, I, probably, I hate that Ricky Gervais pose, but in this case, it's absolutely perfect for illustrating what I'm talking about. So there he is, feast your eyes. Um, so it could be that, that Homer kind of at a deep level does not believe in God, but he might self-present as if he's religious. He could do this for various reasons. Um, and it turns out that we can easily measure the self-report, but a lot of the times what we want to know is that deeper underlying belief or lack thereof, uh, which really presents a puzzle. And this is not at all a new puzzle in psychology and allied disciplines. Um, so we've known for a long time that self-reports can mislead. 
And so there have been a lot of efforts over the decades to try to get to sort of an underlying belief or attitude. Uh, so one approach, uh, I like this paper and follow-ups on it, that are admissions of problem drinking um, and other problematic behavior. So it, it seems like it can work. I mean, admittedly, suspicion was through the roof, but also our our, our cover story was not especially plausible, so that's to be expected. Um, but that's kind of one type of task you could use to potentially get more honest answers from people. Um, another one, this one is a paper from, I believe, back in the 60s. Uh, randomized response methods are an interesting way where you give people the same survey, but again, you're going to try to get more honest answers from people. Um, and so how a randomized response survey might work is you give people a coin or some other randomization instrument. I think it's easiest to illustrate with a coin. And you tell them, all right, I'm going to ask you a question. And you flip the coin. Don't show me the coin. If the coin comes up heads, say yes. If the coin comes up tails, give me an honest yes or no answer to this question. Um, so then you ask people sensitive questions. So you could say, like, are you addicted to heroin? They flip a coin. Now, uh, if they say yes, which should happen half the time, you actually don't know that this person's addicted to heroin because you know half the time the coin would come up heads and they would be saying yes anyway. So this basically gives participants an out where they can give the socially undesirable answer and blame the coin. Um, and then you have to work backwards from the aggregate response and figure, all right, you do some fun probability, half the coin, half the yeses were probably due to the coin. Well, sorry. 50% of the coin tosses would result in them saying yes. So you're basically looking for excess yeses above that 50% margin. Um, I'll do another show of digital hands. Has anybody run a, a randomized response study before? None? All right. I'll tell you guys a fun anecdote about this one. So we tried this one again in Kentucky, trying to find atheists. Um, and so Kentucky is a huge like basketball school. They love their basketball. Um, and at the beginning, it's like at the end of August, so school year is just starting. They uh, release tickets for the basketball team's first practice. So they do a public practice. And bizarrely, people line up for days. They like camp out on the sidewalks, just hoping to get tickets for this first practice. Um, and so we thought this would be a great data collection opportunity because we've got a bunch of people who are just literally like camping out in line and we could walk down and give them all of our surveys. And we also thought that there's probably pretty large overlap between say people who are strongly religious and people who might like Kentucky's very religious and their second religion is basketball. So we thought this is likely to be a fairly religious group, but there might be some closet atheists. So we tried to do a randomized response study uh, to all of these people in line. Um, where they'd flip the coin and uh, we re reversed it. So we said, if it comes up heads, say no. If it comes up tails, give us an honest answer. And then we'd ask questions like, do you believe in God? Um, think our, we were assuming that we'd get, you know, whatever, 55% of people saying no. You figure 50% is due to the coin. That would mean 5% atheists, plus or minus. Um, that's what we thought. We also had a foil kind of one where you thought, all right, we need to calibrate this measure and not just ask about belief in God. So we asked people like, are you a University of Kentucky basketball fan? Uh, obviously, if they're sleeping outside to get tickets to watch people practice, they're a University of Kentucky basketball fan. So that one, it turns out, came out exactly as expected. Like 50% of people said no for the basketball one. So that's just people giving the you know, the coin answer. Um, so then we looked at the data for, okay, are we going to get more than 50% of people saying no when we ask if they believe in God? Which would mean that we had some secret atheists who were going to blame the coin for, for them answering no. And that's not at all what we found. Uh, it turns out only about 10% of people said no, uh, which means that our, our best guess is that people were so strongly religious, like they didn't want to accidentally look like an atheist because a coin told them to. So they like overcorrected. Um, 
that's my fun randomized response study. So the, the core idea seems solid, but as that also illustrates, there are some questions where even like coercing people to admit to something, they're not going to want to do it. Um, so not to dwell too much on details of randomized response or our good friend, the, the bogus pipeline, but just kind of to float the idea that these were ideas uh, that were around to try to get at true responses in survey designs, because we want to access underlying attitudes, not just what people are willing to tell us. And uh, actually on randomized response, you still see it used a fair bit these days in a lot of kind of large scale survey work, but it also tapered off pretty rapidly, um, kind of late 90s, early 2000s, uh, right at the same time we saw a huge uptick in kind of more cognitive based tasks. So implicit measures of attitudes, um, things that where we're inferring attitudes from response latencies, response times, um, some of them it's, you know, you give people a lot of choices on things and you look at kind of what's their probability of making one choice over another uh, across a massive kind of within subjects repeated measures design. Um, so it, it really looks like my read on the literature is for a while we were trying to find ways to basically trick or coerce our participants into giving us honest answers. And then uh, at least in social psychology, those methods got dropped like a bad habit as soon as people started trying to develop these computer tasks to ostensibly give us that direct access to what people are thinking. So we dropped the bogus pipelines and we thought if we can design a cool enough computer study, that'll be a true pipeline to underlying attitudes. Uh, the most famous of which is this one, the IAT. Um, and basically it's having people categorize either words or images. Um, and then they also have to do words that are sorted by valence, or you can do it by a semantic content. But this was just showing a kind of classic uh, white target versus black target, uh, good versus bad IIT. So on the left, if you look at the response options, you'll hit one response key when a picture shows up or a word, if it's either a picture of a white person or a, a bad sounding word, negatively valenced word, you use another response key for both black people, good words. Um, the, the pairings get switched. And so all you're inferring essentially in a, a classic IAT is you're just looking at response times and you're seeing, are people slower, for instance, to pair black with good than white with good? So you're seeing, uh, you know, is either the black or the white kind of more uh, conceptually close to good, good valence concepts as opposed to negatively valenced ones? Um, pretty standard IAT setup. There's now like, I would guess, several gajillion uh, variants of this. So you can have single target where um, instead of having white or bad, black or good, it would be like white is paired with bad some of the time, white is paired with good some of the time, and you drop one category entirely. Um, that's one option. This one is just showing valence. So the words are either good or bad. You can do it semantically, like I said. So uh, we did. God, it was like my master's thesis study. We did a really bad IAT where we went for like trust, semantic words semantically related to trust versus distrust. Um, people have done it to try to look for implicit associations with specific like emotional reactions. So like, oh, is this a proud word or a, or a, a shamed word? Um, so basically it's, it's flexible. You can plug in a lot of different things uh, and try to draw inferences based on on reactions times, basically. And over the years, it's been around 20 plus years by now. Um, they've done things to try to improve the scoring algorithm. So since you're looking at reaction times, what happens if somebody stalls out and it takes them like four seconds to give an answer instead of your normal like 400 millisecond answer? Uh, what happens if they skip a trial? What do you do if they get one wrong? Um, so it, it looks like there's been just this cottage industry on the IAT over the last 20 years of refining the tool how do we get kind of a pure measure of IAT-ness, whatever that is. Um, it's also been joined by a lot of kind of other implicit uh, measures. So the affect misattribution paradigm, I don't remember if I have a slide of it. So that one basically um, in the standard affect version, it's like you'd show people uh, Chinese characters and say, some of these mean good things, some of them mean bad things. You're basically giving them a choice, good, bad, good, bad. You're showing them a symbol that they don't know anything about, but you can like sneakily 
show them a different picture first. So I could show you a picture of, say, uh, here's a black man. OK, now there's this Chinese character. And, it, and you have to say, is this a good or a bad Chinese character? And it turns out people are swayed by the first image we show them. Um, so if they have kind of negative associations towards the category, they'll misidentify the Chinese characters as being negative more often. Um, pretty straightforward. Lexical decision task. Again, this is uh, kind of a reaction time based. You're giving people choices. And again, we're trying to infer some underlying attitude from their performance in this, um, in this little computer task, which all sounds good. Um, I confess, yeah, when I started grad school in 06, uh, I heard about the IAT for the first time and I was like, sweet, this is how we can like, get inside people's heads and figure out what their underlying true attitudes are. Um, that's kind of how, I don't know, like I wasn't an especially well-read early social psychology grad student, but that was the vibe I had, that these were tools that let us access true attitudes, uh, kind of free of socially desirable responding, which is, you know, what we want a lot of the time. Turns out, uh, so I'll walk through the IAT, not because I think it's particularly good, but just because it is kind of the biggest, most famous of these tasks. Um, and it's, it's certainly the most studied, so. Um, and we can look at kind of the IAT as it's advertised, both kind of two naive researchers like a younger Will, um, or especially as it's advertised to the public. And we can compare that to kind of what we're learning about how it actually works. So how is it advertised? So here's the initial IAT paper from 98. Um, and it's interesting, this paper is like very reasonable in its inferences. They don't claim that we're, we've discovered a true pipeline to people's attitudes. Uh, they're really cautious and say, we can use this measure to figure out how closely associated people hold two different concepts. And they start out with like, oh, if we're looking at flowers versus insects, do people have a more positive association with flowers than with insects? Seems like they would. Um, and so it was really just pinning down kind of the the course cognitive details of, can we use this task to look at associations between concepts? Um, it quickly took off though, because at the end, they included some evaluative versions of it. So uh, you can see at the very end, they talk about uh, the black versus white, pleasant versus unpleasant. So this has become kind of the standard IAT used to measure things like implicit racism. Um, so the team behind the IT, they put up this website, Project Implicit, where they kind of constantly are churning through studies and collecting data on people's IATs. It's kind of a really cool uh, both science communication and data collection project, because on the one hand, they have this public facing side where the public, you know, anybody can get the link. Uh, they can come in and take sample IATs. Um, and as they take those, they'll learn a bit about the task. Uh, and I always like looking at how they represent the task to, you know, public facing participants who come on in. So people don't always say what's on their minds. One reason is that they're unwilling. For example, somebody might report smoking a pack of cigarettes per day because they're embarrassed to admit that they smoke too. Another reason is that they are unable. A smoker might truly believe that she smokes a pack a day or might not keep track at all. The difference between being unwilling and unable is the difference between purposely hiding from something uh, something from someone and unknowingly hiding something from yourself. The IAT measures attitudes and beliefs that people may be unwilling or unable to report. Um, and it may be especially interesting if you get a mismatch between your implicitly measured attitude and kind of how you think you feel about something. Um, so I think if we kind of deconstruct their language here, it seems pretty clear that they're saying you've got like a deep inside true attitude. And you might not always express that to others. Maybe you're unwilling. Maybe you're just openly lying about it. Or two, maybe you're self-deluded. And so you're not even admitting this deeper attitude. And the IAT is a tool that will let us get at that internal thing. And if it doesn't match up with how you feel, like if your, I guess, self-perceptions of your own attitudes, um, they say that's really interesting because it means that you have associations that you didn't even realize. Um, and so I think the crux of it is right here. So it's measuring stuff that you are unwilling or unable to report, but the assumption as they're publicly representing it is that this is a true attitude somewhere inside you or a true belief in your head 
that for whatever reason isn't getting out and it's the IAT letting it out. Um, so if we're back to our, our Homer here, uh, oops, basically the self report would be on the left. It's billing it at the IAT is being billed as the IAT lets us look and see what's in that little thought bubble. Or even more spectacularly, it could be that you're not even consciously aware of that thought bubble. So it might tell you thought bubbles that you can't even consciously access, which would be sweet if it did that. Uh, that, would, that would be a remarkable tool. Um, so if we look at kind of what the literature surrounding the IAT over time, uh, these ones I didn't sort. I just looked up like IAT on Google Scholar, and it's probably sorting by like citations. So they, they published the initial paper in 98. And then I don't know if they're showing up. They had like an, oh, yeah. So over on the right, we have understanding and using the IAT. They had a series of three or four papers on that. So understanding the IAT one. Uh, it was like uh, reliability. Two, okay, we'll look at construct validity. Uh, then they had a bunch of meta-analyses. And we have three whole years later, they, they want to do another paper saying, oh, this task we invented like three years ago, let's give you an update on that. And then they waited a few more years, and then they said, okay, now let's give you the update at seven years old about this. So it's just churning out papers saying, what do we know about the IAT? We keep doing studies about the IAT and then doing these kinds of meta reports about how the IAT works. Um, and so here's how it's being publicly represented at that time. You get really quite a different story if you, if you start combing through a lot of this work that where they, it seemed like as soon as the IAT was released, they just said, all right, we're gonna have a cottage industry of, of doing reports about the IAT. Um, and there, the evidence kind of behind the public view turns out to be pretty messy and mixed uh, relatively quickly. Um, so here was Tony Greenwald as one of the IAT uh, originators, and a huge team of people wrote pretty recently. Uh, I don't. I think this one's out in print. If not, like the the preprints up. They said, "All right, what have we learned over the last twenty years?" And they kind of go through a lot of bullet points saying, all right, we're going to look at five main things. One, what are the best practices for doing the IAT? Two, what can we confidently say about what we've learned with the IAT? Um, three, how do we interpret it? So aside from just like the numbers that get spit out of our algorithm when we run the IAT, theoretically, what does that mean? Um, four, what are kind of big remaining questions? And then five, what are questions arising, blah, blah, blah. And what's interesting on this one, uh, some of, if you comb through some of their like, what are significant questions about the IAT? It includes things like, what specifically does the IAT measure? So we're 20 years on, we've got like gajillions of papers on it. Um, and we're still, you know, we don't have what is this measure upgraded to like our summary of what can confidently be learned. That's still in the like remaining questions category. Um, and so this is one of the original team members being pretty open that, you know, there's, there's, Here's some of the big questions that we don't know is, you know, it turns out we don't have good uh, test retest reliability, for instance. If I give you an IAT today and I give it to you in a week, your scores might not be all that strongly correlated. So does that reflect it not being a good measure? Does that mean that the underlying attitude changes rapidly, but we're tracking it well? Uh, we still largely don't know that. Um, another kind of open standing question is it turns out the predictive and discriminant validity of the task is not great. If I give you sort of the black, white, pleasant, unpleasant IAT, and then I give you a measure where I just ask you like, hey, do you think white people are more pleasant than black people? It turns out that if I have both of those measures, the IAT one and the self-report, I can predict your behavior a lot better from the self-report than I can from the IAT. So the kind of incremental validity, what do we buy by adding the IAT is, pretty mixed is my read on the literature right now. Um, and so Uli Shimek had kind of a, a reflection on this uh, where he raised both some methodological and psychometric concerns and also some conceptual ones um, where he said, you know, let's look at construct validity. And he showed that just kind of by our standard, you know, when you teach research methods, we have benchmarks for what you want to do to establish uh, construct validity for a new construct. And he said that 20 years on the IAT still doesn't pass like a basic test of construct validity. So we can get numbers from people when we turn them through the IAT, but we still don't quite know what's being measured there. 
and it doesn't seem to be measuring what we're hoping it did. So it's not tapping into the individual level um, attitudes. Now, there are, it's not that it's just throwing out noise. So you, there are kind of systematic patterns in IAT results. Um, since they've put up the IAT as just a data collection tool all over, um, you can look at data and look in, you can look down to like zip code in the US, so where people are taking the test. And there's actually some pretty cool papers coming out now where you can look at like the average black versus white IAT scores, and you can predict it by, say, the county level uh, prevalence of slavery 150 years ago. So places where there are a lot of slavery back in the day show kind of more racist looking IATs still today. Um, so it's tracking stuff in the world. It just seems to not necessarily be tracking individual level attitudes in a way that we'd kind of psychometrically want, um, which is a bit problematic for kind of how it's being built and how us as researchers might want to use it. So my background, I'm not a social cognition researcher who's, who cares deeply about kind of the procedural minutia of the IAT. There are researchers out there who do that, good for them. Um, but for me, I, I kind of like jumping from method to method to answer questions about religion. So when I first heard about the IAT, I thought, great, this is a way to measure people's trust or distrust of atheists in a way that's kind of less direct than just asking them. Um, and that's, that seems like what we want it to do, but both their originators and increasingly the critics are acknowledging that it doesn't seem to directly do that. Um, this is a quite recent, and I guess it's about a year old by now, a cool paper by Keith Payne, who he doesn't do as much work with the IAT. He came up with the AMP um, and was reflecting on, well, if, say, the IAT doesn't seem to be tracking individual level uh, attitudes, um, as reflected in the fact that it doesn't seem to predict like behavior particularly well, uh, it doesn't seem to predict individual stuff well, but it does have meaningful kind of uh, coarser aggregate regional differences. Um, and also has looked at some of some seemingly anomalous findings in the implicit bias literature. So one that uh, they talk about a bunch is if you give sort of the black versus white IAT, you will find in the US that a lot, uh, much of the time, even black participants will show an implicit anti-black bias, which presumably that's not tracking their attitudes. Um, so Keith and colleagues over the years, they've said, well, maybe something like the IAT isn't so much picking up an individual's attitudes, but it's picking up sort of a broader kind of cultural attitude. Uh, it's picking up something out in the world that we're aware of. And if I'm aware of, say, racism in the US, I might show an IAT score that looks racist, but it's me reflecting the cultural level association rather than an individual thing. And so in this little paper, he said, if we're looking at implicit measures of racism, for example, we're not measuring people's individual attitudes. Uh, instead, we're basically measuring systemic racism as is, it's expressed through a weird computer task. So if people are living in the US in a, in a place where you have systemic racism creating these divides and disparities, people will be aware of those disparities and that'll turn up in the IAT as if they're individually uh, racist, but it's just kind of awareness of a, a, a shitty system with a lot of disparities, um, which is interesting. So uh, on that level, like if we're thinking about these implicit measures, um, I, I didn't actually talk too much specifically about implicit measures of religion in, in this chat today, because I thought it'd be worth looking at, you know, they've mostly the overwhelmingly the most common use of the IAT is studying something like racism. And, you know, here's what we've got that we don't even know if the most common implicit measure is a good measure of the thing that it's been used the most to study, um, which should perhaps give us a bit of caution in thinking about, oh, I can just take an IAT or an AMP or some other task and plug it into my study about religion and think I'm measuring an underlying attitude. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be using these measures, but we should be really careful of if we're going to use this measure, are we using it to ask a question that the method is capable of answering? Um, so implicit measures, really, I think I used some early on and even recently, along with some people in your room over there, we've published one where we came up with an AMP uh, that was tailored to religion. And so I think it's potentially a useful tool. 
but some questions we should be asking ourselves before we just kind of plug an implicit measure in is one, is it necessary? So are we measuring something that people would necessarily conceal? I bring that one up because yeah, in my master's thesis, I was like, oh, I want to measure distrust of atheists. So we did an IAT on distrust of atheists and sure enough, the IAT showed that people don't trust atheists, but people in the U S are totally willing to just tell me that they don't trust atheists. So I, I did this study. I could have just asked people like, Hey, do you think atheists are bad? And they would have been like, yeah, they're definitely bad. Um, so yeah, we, instead we had a task that took a half hour per participant and then we had to do a complicated scoring algorithm and it showed us something that people would have told us if we just would have asked them. So a lot of the time implicit measure might not be necessary. Um, they, they kind of feel fun. Uh, Two, I think it's important thinking back to especially that Keith Payne paper at the end and the Uli Shimek one where, you know, he's saying we have a method in search of a construct was the Shimek approach. And Keith is saying, oh, no, what it measures is just kind of awareness of systemic racism. So if it's actually measuring a broader cultural association rather than an individual thing, that's fine. That could be a very useful thing to to measure. But you only want to use that measure if your hypothesis is about this kind of broader cultural association. If you have a hypothesis about an individual level attitude, it could be that these measures aren't really what we need to assess that. And so if, if you're thinking about that, it could be that there's a lot of alternative measures that could get us closer to what we're hoping to measure. Um, and for that, we could even come full circle to some. So you can tell I have great handwriting uh, trying to draw up a little flow chart. So, are you interested in studying a broad cultural association? Does my mouse show up when I do this or no? Woohoo! Look at it go, look at it go. Um, are you interested in studying a broad cultural association rather than an individual attitude? If the answer is yes, cool. Uh, do you like care about psychometrics a great deal? Yes or no? Uh, my read is the AMP generally is stronger on a lot of our our basic psychometrics than the IAT. So like if you're so, so on psychometrics, but you want something that's easily communicated because everybody's heard of the IAT by now. So sometimes for like public facing stuff, the IAT is a good choice, even though it's not psychometrically great, just because people have heard of it. So yeah, this flowchart says if, if you're looking at a broad cultural association and uh, then you just kind of decide to amp or IAT based on, on your attitudes towards psychometrics. If you're not interested in a broad cultural association, I'd, I'd kind of say, let's skip this entirely. And then you can have some choices for methods. So are you trying to make inferences about a population level thing or individual one? If you're looking at just like, you know, what's the population prevalence of atheism, um, that randomized response maybe could do it. Although in my atheist example, I found people under reporting atheism relative to what the coin made them do. Um, or there's things like unmatched count and list techniques can give you aggregate population level uh, estimates of things that people might be loath to admit in a self-report. Um, but a lot of the times we are interested in those individual level attitudes that people might hide. And I think, unfortunately, we're not in a great situation to recommend and say, look, this is the go-to task for measuring somebody's deepest, darkest secrets. Um, that's that's a hard task. We're, we're not great at that. And it could be that if that's what you really want, we need to go full circle and, you know, get those bogus pipeline studies back up and running. Um, because yeah, it, none of what's been developed seems like exactly the right tool for that job yet. Um, which is a shame because I think that's, that's what we think we're doing a lot of the time when we ramp up an IAT study. Um, so I think I'd be happy to open it to question or like, since I've used the list technique before, the unmatched count, I threw some slides in at the end if people wanted to see how it worked, but it's totally irrelevant to this talk. I just had spare slides to bring in. But we could open it now and do some like work chopping and, and chatting about, you know, have I been too harsh on the IAT? Is it more useful than I've given it credit for? Um, but yeah, let's chat. Oh yeah, and I was gonna close by showing my shirt. Science is so difficult, it makes me sad. It's difficult, so, so this it makes me sad. Uh, Ayana said pretty much the same thing about an hour and 15 minutes ago. <laughs>
we, we also share an office, so this is like... <laughs> it's, it's a, a real cheery place. place. <laughs> So if ever anyone has a question, please come here. So we'll, we'll hear it because uh, I can't put uh, the microphones in two computers at once. So this will be here, so that will be on stream. And uh, if you talk in here. Right, so questions? Is, is the camera stationary? Like, like, can I always be facing towards you, or can it face out? Well, it can face out. That's not a problem. Here's everyone. I'm just hey everyone! Hey everyone. <laughs> um, but uh, people need to come up here to ask the question. So please, who's first? Well, we can't like shout the question. Um, well, uh, did you just hear John's question? I mean, John's, John's uh, remark? I Will? Shout it as if you Better follow the record. Somehow I can hear Ianna here, so everybody needs to bring their questions to So, uh, so I, I had a question about whether or not uh, you have a view on uh, on the the um, on the role that implicit measures play in the measurement of states versus traits, right? So the traditional interpretation is that it measures traits of some kind, right? I mean, that's certainly the, the kind of like Harvard School interpretation of the IAT. But, but, but there, have been some, there has been some recent kind of pushback on the idea that the best way to think about the IAT and other measures is, is, as, a, is as a measure of traits. Um, and then the, then the emphasis is on, on, on kind of like very malleable and changeable and context-specific states instead. Do you, do you have thoughts about that? Um, I haven't thought too much about that. I'm I think since I read that he's a like implicit prejudice is just a measure of kind of awareness of systemic racism in paper. It seems like you could be a state like fluctuation in an implicit measure just with fluctuating salience of kind of awareness of some of these broader cultural issues. Um, so I don't see any particular reason that that sort of cultural association. Yeah. I think I get a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Keith would like that actually, right? Because Keith's whole thing about the AM, the AMP, is that he he does think that it's a virtue that the AMP has has higher test retest reliability that, than the IAT. And I think if you if you have that assumption that if you have a normative assumption that test retest reliability is a good thing, then I think you, you probably do also assume that what these measures are meant to measure is something stable, right? So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems like, like it would be a hard, hard time, time uh, trying to convince somebody, somebody like. You're, you're just, just kind of seeing awareness of how racist the U.S. is, right. like, like fluctuates wildly. It could be that like salience of it comes and goes. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, no, that's I'm not sure. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, next person. Okay, well, there's nobody else, so this is good, this is good. I can then ask you a question. Look, the um, study you did with the base, uh, basketball fans, yeah. Will? Yeah, I saw, I was trying to, the like chat thing came up, I'm trying to find it. Right. So, or was, that, was the chat the same as your question, or you just wanted to chat more about the basketball fans? I, that one was weird. I, I don't know what the chat is, I haven't seen it. So, what's the okay. chat? Sorry, that was me. I didn't want to disturb. Please ask your question first, Conrad. I'll ask after, if you don't mind. Okay, cool. All right, so my question is, uh, would it help, do you think, if you had uh, two conditions in that study? One where, if it came up heads, they had to say, um, that uh, they were atheist, and the other one that if it came up heads, they had to say that they're religious. And then you could compare the, uh, the numbers there. Yeah, I think that would be the most sensible approach, is have multiple conditions, one of them where you say, like, do you believe in God? But heads is yes, one of them where heads is no. And then hopefully you can triangulate across conditions and get similar stable estimates. That was our initial plan, was we thought, all right, we'll just do kind of a proof of concept with these weirdos waiting in line for basketball tickets, and then we'll do a bunch of in-lab follow-up. Um, 
But since our results were so far away from expectation, we just totally turned away from the method. But I think if we went back and did it more seriously, that would be a good way to do it. Um, you know, flip and that's somewhat related to a project with unmatched count, which kind of has a similar problem where you're asking people either to identify as somebody who does something or who doesn't do something. Um, so we've tried flipping the valence on that to kind of triangulate. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all quite tricky. Hmm. Especially, I had such high hopes for that coin one, because it's, I like those tasks where you can like, I can look at it and be like, okay, I know what the answer should look like, and I know what's going on here. I will have 50% for people flipping the coin, and then I'll have some leftover. Yeah. And like exactly zero of the papers I've read on that said, here's what to do if people drastically under-report what you'd expect the coin to do. <laughs> All right, cool. Jacob? Uh, hello, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, I was just thinking about the second paradigm uh, with the coin. Uh, so you ask the questions repeatedly, because to have a fair coin that will give you 50-50 chance of each side is unrealistic, unless you ask 5,000 times. Like, you yeah, get, so it's a game of large numbers, and if you don't have them, you don't get 50 per, 50 person chance. Yeah, basically on that one, um, I have seen some people trying to do it with kind of repeated trials within one participant, and it gets a bit messy. Um, but on something like randomized response, that's typically used if I'm trying to estimate some population prevalence level, and I can get a sample of like a thousand people where across my thousand people I should get relatively close to 500 heads. Whereas, you know, if I'm getting 750 people saying yes, then I can, you kind of do the stats to work back. But yeah, a lot of those tasks end up being really kind of participant intensive. Okay, uh, I don't think it solves the problem with 50% chance on the coin, but, uh... Thank you. Uh, what about Stroop test? What are you thinking about Stroop test? Because that's that's cognitive, uh, cognitively involved task, and if you use some uh, words that are related and mix it with colors, uh, the, the conflict of the condition should help you uh, using it as an input as a digit test. Yeah, I mean, I think. Something like the Stroop can work quite well for this stuff, and it also helps that I think we have just a much better uh, kind of knowledge base on what are the processes involved in the Stroop. Um, so I know some people have done kind of evaluative Stroop versions. Uh, you can also add in some like process association analyses to try to figure out, is it, I mean, stepping back a bit for why you might want to do that is, let's say you're doing an IAT and it's like, white is paired with good, black is paired with bad, and all you get is a relative difference. So you don't know whether, let's say somebody shows a stronger preference for white versus black in that one. You don't know whether that's yeah, which, which is not the problem of the two Yeah, exactly. The problem is that that was with through task, uh, you avoid this problem, because you exactly know what the correct answer is, and how long it takes for a person to process the color, and to process the concept. And so, so you avoid all the problem that you're describing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Scoop's way better just because we understand the task to like such a finer degree of detail. Um, oh, I see. So it does give you that much more control. Totally agree. But you, you're not using that one. I don't tend to use any of these these days. But if I were to try to use one, I'd, I'd go Scoop first. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, been, it's been done, though. Uh, yeah. John, come, come on up. Come on up, John. <laughs> <laughs> I appoint John my champion to answer this question. So, so, uh, um, so Nick, Nicholas Gibson, um, in like in his in his sort of 2007 doctorate, uh, tried to use the Stroop test as a kind of religiosity measure. Uh, and uh, and it did not go well, but I do not remember why. No. Uh, but but uh, but but you can find the dissertation online. Like it's been a long time since I read it. But um, but they yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm not a researcher in this field. Very valuable. Very much in this field. I'm just trying to yeah. Uh, I mean, why, why one one thing works and one doesn't. But if we know both don't, uh, that is. Fair. Yeah. 
I mean, there, there's also a bit of controversy over like what the emotional troop, like which is basically what we're talking about, right? Like an adaptation of the emotional troop rather than the traditional troop task. And there's some controversy over what that measures as well. I mean, in some ways, a lot of the similar issues pop up um, across these different measures. Um, and then, of course, once you try to correlate these measures with each other, with one another, <laughs> like you discover that like it's not obvious that they they measure the same thing, uh, which is troubling because you know putatively they're all meant to measure something something kind of related to one another. Um, so yeah, so the, I think there's trouble all around. And on, and on the same note, uh, my last question, if you don't mind, is uh, uh, why we, because uh, religiosity uh, is somewhat related to moral disgust, right? It it's, uh, gives us way to act in a certain situations and you should be opposed to some certain activity or saying something because of your uh, religiosity. Whereas if you're an atheist, uh, you probably do not have these uh, moral disgust-related responses. Is, is, is that um, It could be. So I That's don't have a strong background in the emotion test. So I'd imagine that you would be able to find some specific associations where you'd expect that a religious person definitely has more of this moral disgust association than would an atheist. Um, but I think a lot of the inferences you'd have to make in a task like that could get really weird. So I'm reminded this isn't directly relevant to the um, moral disgust one, but there have been studies where uh, you know you have people throw darts at a dartboard and you have a picture of Jesus on the dartboard, and they they found you know if people are more religious, they they miss the bullseye like more than they should, so they <laughs> seem to not be hitting Jesus in the face, um, or. Uh, we had talked about some in graduate school. God, we planned some stupid ideas in grad school. Uh, we were gonna get like, in like arcades, there's like the boxing thing and you punch the boxing bag and it'll tell you how hard you hit it. Uh, we were thinking of getting one of those in the lab to see if people would pull their punches if you like put a picture of Jesus on it so, and tell people, punch it as hard as you can, are they gonna let up? So looking for these kinds of <laughs> more subtle things. But those are spell part because we were thinking, you know, I could be an atheist, but let's say I'm just sort of like culturally sensitive I might not, I don't have to believe in Jesus to perhaps think it's in poor form to like stick a dart right between his eyes or to punch him in the face. No. <laughs> so it, there could be other reasons to end up showing the reaction that looks like moral disgust or pulling your punches that have nothing to do with the belief. Um, yeah, but I, I, I like the idea of using these, these kinds of tools. Um, and every time I've sat down and start fighting and we found ourselves able to think of kind of plausible reasons why an atheist might end up looking like they were religious on it that don't directly have to do with them being some closet theist. Um, I think there's potential there. I'm just not sure how to kind of pick it apart. Hmm. Thank you very much for your answers. And again, thank you for the presentation. It was inspiring. <laughs> It's supposed to be demotivating. I'm trying to make people feel better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I like to look for new solutions. It's, it's always right. inspiring to see where the road doesn't go. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I feel kind of the same on some of these. Like, it'd be great if these tasks were as advertised. That'd be wonderful. Hmm. All right. Other questions? Yeah, Martin, come on up. Come on down. <laughs> Hi, Will. Um, good, just a quick follow-up on this discussion. Uh, recently in Poland, I was attending uh, the first communion of um, niece of my wife. And it's an anecdote, but she got a cake, like a celebratory cake for the communion with a huge Jesus on the cake. And they just started to cut the cake and I was just like, oh, I don't want to eat his face. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> and, you know, this, so I don't know about the moral disgust uh, thing here, but and it's, uh, apologies, I have a half-baked question here, but you know, this is a discussion forum. So uh, maybe um, there is another method I heard uh, about in association with uh, the um, opinions in Russia about Putin and you know how to actually get at the opinions of Russians. And I don't remember correctly how it worked, and I remember I didn't um, understand it properly, but it was something like if you know that, you know, so let's say opinion about Putin is one, the one variable that we are interested in, and then you may have different variables that you know are associated with, with 
this variable. So then you know you can ask like second half of the population only the other question to get at the, the actual opinion. Do you have you know some more knowledge about this methodology? That was, so is that sort of like a list technique or American yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I like those methods and have some slides on them and we've actually been doing a bunch of piloting trying to find ways to get them. So the idea is if I want to know how many of my participants uh, use heroin, if I just ask them, hey, do you use heroin, everybody's going to say no. Um, but I can do this list task where I say, all right, I'm going to give everybody a list of statements, and you just tell me how many are true. So I have a pogo stick. I eat a hot dog for breakfast every day. You know, my favorite color is yellow. And so I give those three statements to a bunch of people. And some people say one of those is true for me. Some people say two is true for me, and then I can take the average. And then I have a second group of people where I, oh god, I'm going to have to remember what those were. I got a pogo stick, I eat a hot dog for breakfast every day, my favorite color is yellow. Um, I think Putin should be executed. Uh, <laughs> so presumably, I could look at the mm -hmm. difference in average scores and say, those are the people who right. think Putin should be executed. Um, so I actually quite like this measure for getting at kind of an aggregate population level estimate of what's out there. It's easy to administer. Um, yeah. When I've used it, when it breaks down, it breaks down in obvious and easy to understand ways. Uh, so just sometimes participants get really confused and they give absolute garbage answers. <laughs> um, whereas like, when things went wrong with some of the other, like if, if people aren't doing the IAT right, I have no idea if I'm gonna be able to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I really like these list technique ones. Uh, people have even done some work trying to figure out analytic tricks to actually get at kind of more individual rather than aggregate level ones. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of these. Thank you. Cool. That one we actually tried, so we did a nationally representative sample with the list technique. And then we thought it would be fun. There were like some big mega churches in Kentucky when I was living, and we were going to go to a mega church just to see, like, could we estimate how many mega church goers are closet atheists? And we had soft buy-in from the church who really wanted to know how many other people were atheists, but uh, our ethics board was not super thrilled on it. So, but yeah, the church, I'd imagine, much like you know. Putin would like to know how many people think he should be executed so he can find them. <laughs> the church is fully on board with, yeah, tell us how many of these people are actually heathens that we need to purge. <laughs> I have to ask, why was the ethics board having problems with this? Um, I mean, I think they were legitimately concerned about anonymity and protecting any closet atheists, but they just didn't realize that that was the whole point of the task, is we wouldn't actually be able to identify which people. Right. So I think they had a, their heart was in the right place and saying, you know, they just didn't realize that the task itself wouldn't allow us to have the information that they were worried would get out. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. All right, well, it's uh, half past four, uh, so uh, I'm thinking we should take a, just a couple of minutes break and then we should gather back together for the round table session. Um, so, uh, Will, can you hang around and join us for the round table or do you need to head off? Um, I will be, I've got to disappear for a couple of minutes. I'll try to hop back on in a bit, but it could be if anybody has a pressing question for me and I'm not in here, Ayanna knows how to like send me a message on WhatsApp and I'll try to. <laughs> I can text them. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll be right laughs> <next. laughs> All right, cool. Cool. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. See ya.